Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at the 1990s, the impact of globalization and its ultimate impact on the United States and the larger spheres. So let's get started. In the end of the 80s and the dawn of the 90s, we see that the communist system utterly collapsed and it happened a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. China saw the total communist approach led to a student demonstration that led to the Tiananmen Square massacres. Germany saw their borders collapse between East and West Berlin and then East and West Germany as a whole in 1990. And in 91, the Soviet Union found that they could no longer exist in the manner that they always had and were forced to abandon communism and then Russia made the communist parties illegal. The end of the Cold War meant that capitalism had won. And that was the surprising thing that no one kind of expected when the Cold War began. We all kind of expected that the Cold War was going to end with nuclear holocaust. But it didn't, and that's awesome. And it's not just, you know, Russia that all of a sudden got free. It was all the satellite nations that were around Russia that also quote unquote got free. And that with the fall of communism, we kind of see the turning of where other problems could be addressed and other problems that could be fixed. And one of these was in Iraq. Now, when we look at Iraq, we have a quote unquote presidential dictator. Oh, he, is, he is a president. He, he is elected by the people in the illusion that there is a election and that it is democratic, but he is the sole dictator of the people. And Saddam Hussein was known for coming to power in a very bloody coup and then maintained that through both a cult of personality and a lot of blaming different peoples and groups when things went wrong with the nation. And for a long time, the minority group that he pointed out and said it's all their fault was the Kurdish people. And the Kurds were an ethnic group in Iraq who really just wanted freedom from the state. And in 89, when the Kurds helped the Iranians into and attack Iraq, Saddam responded by using sarin nerve gas on them and killed 5,000 civilians. And this continued to be what we would see from him. Like, this was his scapegoat. This was his it's all their fault moment. In August of 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And the big reason for this was with the amount of oil that Iraq controlled and the amount of oil reserves that was under the ground in Kuwait, Saddam Hussein would control about a quarter of all the world's oil. Now, there was some trumped up uh, defending the border charges that happened, but realistically, the, that didn't happen. And the Kuwaiti defenses were really no match for what the Iraqis threw at them. And Kuwait was, well, anything of value was hauled off. And then he starts moving his forces near Saudi Arabia. And this made the Saudis really nervous because they were in kind of the same boat as the Kuwaitis. Uh, they had a defense force, they had an army, but it was nothing that was going to be able to stand up to Iraq's at the time. So they turned to the United States and the United Nations for help. And Saddam controlled about, at this point, a quarter of all the world's oil. And if he took Saudi Arabia, then we're looking at well over 70%. So this was one of those whoa moments. We see the United Nations put trade sanctions on Iraq and a coalition of nations, including of UN nations, including the United States, England, France, Italy, Egypt, and Syria, all start moving forces into Saudi Arabia, preparing for a counteroffensive. 
November of that year, Bush sends more troops into the region. And by late November, the UN says that the use of force to stop with Saddam or to force him to withdraw was acceptable. And Saddam had until January 15th to leave the area. January 17th, he's still there. So we see this massive air attack happen. And much of Iraq that uh, could be easily defeated was easily defeated. Uh, Iraq launched a couple of missiles, but nothing too big. The big thing that the Iraqis did on their way as they left Kuwait was they set some of the oil wells on fire. Three weeks after the attack against Iraq began, President George Bush Sr. issued an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein, leave Iraq or there will be larger military operations conducted. And when that day came and went, we see Operation Desert Storm, the first Persian Gulf War is enacted. And over the course of three days, we see that the Iraqis were uh, kicked out of Kuwait and were ultimately defeated. And polls across the United States showed that Americans were really happy of how the war was handled, that it was handled very swiftly. There was very little loss of life. And with that, the next question was, what are we going to see happen to Saddam? I mean, you have a man who has convict, who has committed war crimes uh, numerous times, and we knew he had and documented it too, but he was allowed to maintain a place of power in Iraq. And the justification for this was, this guy was crazy, without question, but he could at least hold the various different elements of the region together, which was dangerous. It's one of those old, the devil you know versus the devil you don't situation. Under President Ronald Reagan, we saw a whole lot of taxes in the Reaganomic policies. Uh, we see that programs for the people are cut and taxes go up to try to tackle the mounting economic problems that Reagan inherited. When President Bush Sr. ran for office, his big gimmicky slogan was no new taxes, but you can't go to war and not increase taxes. So he increased taxes. And specifically, the tax rate ran from 28 to 31% under his administration. And you know, that's that's what it is. It happened in reaction to the Persian Gulf War. But when it happened in an election year, it makes getting yourself reelected really hard. The big third party candidate that's that really kind of influences the election of 92 was Ross Perot, this Texas billionaire who spent a hundred million of his own dollars saying he was going to run as an independent. And, and he did. His platform had liberal components, conservative components, but as a third party and kind of not de decisive to one um, platform or another specifically, he didn't garner the votes that he probably would have needed. And if Pro had not run 92, then it's pretty possible that Bush Sr. would have gotten himself another term of office. We see that the election of 92 had 44 million people vote for Clinton, 38 million people vote for Bush, and 20 million people vote for Perot, which, you know, as a third party goes, that's pretty good. There are a lot of reasons that Clinton was successful. Uh, he had early intentions to change health care, welfare, and get the uh, national budget under control. He understood how the public issues worked. He had a 
self-confidence about him and promised to end the ban on homosexuals in the military from a if you were uh, if you were a homosexual and you were identified as homosexual you could be kicked out or capped this was changed to a don't ask don't tell no one would ever ask you your sexual preference you won't tell anyone your sexual preference and that's and that's just that clinton's big changes start in 93 when he appoints ruth bader ginsburg to the supreme court she was a adamant constitutional federal judge um she wanted to continue the liberal movements that she had been doing from the 70s through the 90s we see that during this time one of clinton's big goals was to create a uh, reduce the deficit by half a trillion dollars over the next five years this is going to happen through both spending cuts and new taxes republicans that were led by newt gingrich speaker of the house made these ambitious programs to stimulate the economy with reducing federal debt and federal income taxes the problem is you can't cut debt and taxes and be able to pay everyone the same as it had been and when doing so led to an economic shutdown there was a lot of who's at fault and the person who was usually found at the other end of the finger pointing was newt gingrich and the republicans in 96 the public was so upset with congress's inability to get stuff done that the president's approval rating went through the roof unemployment was down inflation was down the markets were good and clinton is able to secure a second term relatively easily in 96. the biggest crisis that we see foreign policy wise in the late 90s was what was going on in eastern europe yugoslavia was in a state of collapse at this time and the balkans are too during this time the well during the cold war we made sure we had a presence in the region we made sure there was money spent in the region we made sure that the region knew who their friends were especially with proximity to the soviet union now that the soviet union is gone we kind of aren't the presence in the region that we had been and there are some horrible human right violations that take place one of the biggest longest lasting technological developments that happened during this time will be the development of the internet now the internet really was born in the 70s as a way for different people at different facilities to quote unquote talk to each other and share files with each other and the idea of it in a larger sense started spreading very quickly over the course of the next few decades with the development of technology as our day-to-day -day tethered to both each other and the larger world some companies are going to be pointed at with fingers of monopoly and thoughts that you know you're controlling it all for example in 95 microsoft was sued by netscape and netscape was a different web browser you see back in the, these days you had to pay individual web browsers and your phone company to get online netscape said that with the windows 95 program the windows 95 operating system it came loaded with its own internet browser internet explorer and if you already had that on your computer there'd be no reason to use netscape and they said this is a this is a monopoly ultimately the justice department said it's not a monopoly because there were other ways to get online and that's why we're learning about netscape in a history class some companies start going public during this time sharing stocks in their own company sharing stocks in 
dot com businesses and some of these get real expensive real quick and we see some of these tech businesses like eBay or Amazon are worth huge sums of money. Immigration continues to happen during this time. Um, the big thing that starts happening with immigration during this time period is most new immigrants to this country are going to be women and single parent households that are led by women. The 90s also had a couple of big thoughts with race as well. In 92, the Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, the same man who was an NAACP lawyer for Brown versus Board of Education, said that Americans of each race appear to have given up on integration, figured that at this point, integration had gone as far as it was going to go. The O.J. Simpson trial polarized Americans both on right versus wrong, as well as the question of how much of it was based on race. And Louis Farrakhan, leader of the Nation of Islam, called on African Americans to come to Washington, D.C. and participate in a million man march to show solidarity for the race. Over the course of the 70s through the 90s, we see state legislatures are going to start putting tougher sentences for crime. They're going to make uh, harsher single uh, first time offenses. They're going to make it harder to get a parole. And this was kind of a back and forth thing that happens both across states. And then when it gets to national attention, it gets between party groups as well. Republicans said that Democrats were soft on crime and no one wants to run for office saying, yes, I'm soft on crime. So we see Democrats at both state and national levels start pushing these harsher punishments in place. The goal to stop crime ultimately escalated to, well, what can you do? And well, what about the death penalty, capital punishment? Uh, if we're going to incarcerate somebody for 80 years, why don't we just execute them instead? And we see from the 60s through the 90s, there is a big jump in the number of states that are willing to do uh, capital punishment. But afterwards, we see that that number actually starts to go down. The drug war happens during this time too. Um, now mind you, drugs in this country have been here, you know, as long as there's been a country. The difference starts happening in the 60s where we see the shift from uh, marijuana goes to cocaine. Cocaine is powerful and super addictive but also tremendously expensive. At the dawn of the 80s, an ounce of cocaine could cost you $120. By the end of the 80s, it would cost you about 50 bucks. And that was just the tra transition in the drug trafficking networks. When you have cocaine you can do other stuff to it and one of the things you can do to it is make crack crack is based on you use cocaine to make crack and crack is whack <laughs> sorry good not myself crack is super duper addictive it's also ridiculously cheap it started to be the thing that divide up and create turf wars between different gangs. We see that more and more people are going to enter illicit criminal organizations during this time so they can make money by selling this stuff. In 1990, it was a survey of Los Angeles County showed 
that 150,000 different young people belong to over a thousand different gang networks. By 2006, 30% of African American men in their 20s were in prison, on probation, or on parole because of, again, drugs. George Bush Sr. tried to fight drugs by creating the office of the drug czar and spending money on the Say No to Drugs campaign. The Some of you might remember the D.A.R.E. programs. And unfortunately, they had very little impact, very little effect. Um, when the only information was just say no without any larger or why or and this will happen, it didn't have the impact that it might have elsewise. When that didn't happen, we see that there are attempts to regulate American lifestyle more. Um, from the drug czar, we saw the attempted um, mandate on gun control, mandates on abortion, mandates on flag burning, all this stuff. I can't talk about Clinton without talking about the scandal. Well, scandals. Whether it's the, well, let's talk about the big one first. It all starts when this woman, Paula Jones, who was a employee of the state of Arkansas, said that Clinton, when he was governor of Arkansas, had propositioned her to engage in oral sex. And Clinton's attorney, and this is while he's president, said that you cannot sue a sitting president. And so the case was kind of put on hiatus and time goes on. In January of that year, Paula Jones went to, to show that, you know, Clinton was still womanizing and he was still willing to ask women to, to do this kind of stuff. So he, she found this intern, Monica Lewinsky, and you know, Lewinsky said, no, that never happened. The president said, no, that never happened. Uh, Clinton went on national TV saying, you know, infamously, I did not have sex with that woman. And Lewinsky confides in a friend that that was a lie and that they had an affair together. And Linda Tripp records Monica Lewinsky saying all this. This information is then turned over to Special Prosecutor Ken Starr. Ken Starr subpoenas Lewinsky and says, you have two options, comply with the investigation or we're gonna send you to federal prison for perjury. And Lewinsky really didn't have a choice in this matter and says, okay, fine, I'm, I'll, you got it. And Lewinsky says in her testimony that she had lied and that Clinton had lied. And this led to the Clinton case, the impeachment case against President Clinton. And he was not impeached because he had an affair. He was impeached because he lied about having the affair. That was it. Public opinion polls though said that the average American didn't care because, as a whole, they liked what Clinton had done in office. The Republican leaders in the House, they impeach Clinton on the grounds of perjury and obstruction of justice. The impeachment goes before the Senate, and in an impeachment, you need two-thirds of the Senate to vote against the president to remove him from office. However, Clinton didn't get the number of votes needed. And that's why he was able to stay in power. The 90s are also remembered for, well, actually the late 20th century as a whole is remembered for how violence is depicted in the media. The most violent film that we see at this time, or in 1930, was this movie, Public Enemy. And in it, 
they depicted eight people, quote unquote, dying in this movie. Fast forward to the 80s, and you've got the same kind of thing. Well, it had been the same thing until we get to the big slasher movies of then, the big shootout action movies of the 80s. And in some cases, we see that by the late 80s, you had films that had 60 people or more being quote unquote killed on screen. It was estimated by a family watchdog group that a kiddo born in 1991 watching an average amount of TV would see 40,000 people murdered on TV by the time they turned 18. And the thought was that would change American culture about murder and violence forever. Music changed during this time. MTV put t music videos on all the time. Music videos like Thriller, you know, the dancing zombies, Michael Jackson, all right, good. The idea that this music video was more theatrical than music. Pop that had big beats, explicit lyrics, music videos that showed scantily clad individuals. The thought was, again, it was going to corrupt the moral fibers of this nation. Rap, starting off as just a background to music, gets more and more attention. It gets more violent. It has bigger beats. It has fiercer lyrics, anger. Ugh. Ultimately, all these things led to fears of the American culture being changed. During the 2000 presidential election, you have Vice President Al Gore, who very easily secures the nomination for president. And the Republicans put up George Bush Sr. And a, we also see that a third party candidate enters as well, um, Ralph Nader. He was the consumer advocate who made sure that all cars have seatbelts in them. And the main issue between these two, may, uh, between all the candidates, is under the Clinton administration, there was a surplus of cash, a surplus of about a trillion dollars. And what are we going to do with it? And it went back and forth for the 2000 election. Gore, he seemed stiff, he was smart, but he was really unrelatable. Bush had, uh, he was known for butchering the English language and having a background that was definitely sorted. Both of these can, uh, is believed that both of them spent a collective billion dollars to get messages to people. And on election night in 2000, we had something very interesting happen. So you need 270 votes to win. But on election night, it wasn't clear who actually won. Bush had 246, Gore had 267. Florida was the deciding factor. You see, there were a lot of problems that happened in Florida. New machines, new voting systems, ultimately requiring a hand recount of ballots. And we're talking like millions of these things. So much so that the election dragged on. By election night, we didn't have a winner. We didn't have a winner until December when the final tally put that Al Gore had won the popular vote with 51 million votes. Bush won the Electoral College votes with 271. So even though Bush had lost the popular vote, he won the electoral vote. And that's why Bush became president and Al Gore did not. So today we took a look at the 
1990s, the big changes that happened in the United States with the role of globalization and its impact. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.